know that we can bring every need to God in prayer, but there are times when our needs are so deep, our pain is so raw, we don't know how to express our needs. What do we do in those moments? Alistair Begg addresses that question today on Truth For Life as he continues in our study of Romans chapter 8. Now, we're at verse 26, and it is here that we're told that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Paul uh, has been very clear concerning the nature of weakness, and classically so in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 12. And as he reaches the apex of his argument, he says in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12, to keep me from becoming conceited or from getting a big head, because, he said, I've had revelations of God that are so unbelievable that I couldn't even begin to talk about them. And that could give me a sense of dominance and priority and so on. And God, recognizing that, to keep me from getting a big fat head, he gave me a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what it is. He'd asked the Lord three times if he would take it away from him, and three times the answer came back, no. Because, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Okay, he says, therefore, deduction, if that's the case, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. For, he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. It's paradoxical, isn't it? It's ironic. Because the one thing that you're not supposed to admit to is weakness. Everyone is a winner in America. In a book called Nurture Shock, New Thinking About Children, the book says modern parents are wanting to nurture so skillfully that Mother Nature will gasp in admiration at the marvels their parenting produces from the soft clay of children. The assumption is that thinking highly of oneself is a prerequisite for high achievement. John Thornton wrote to Charles Simeon, a very effective pastor in Oxbridge in an earlier generation, and he wrote to him a word of warning that went like this, Charles, watch continually over your own spirit, and do all in love. We must grow downward in humility to soar heavenward. I should recommend you having a watchful eye over yourself. For generally speaking, as is the minister, so are the people. And we have, on numerous occasions, turned to that classic position of expressed weakness in 2 Chronicles 20, which you can turn to for your homework, where Jehoshaphat assembles all of the people in the city square, and he says before God, we have no power to face this vast army that is coming upon us. We do not know what to do. And people could have stood on the sideline and said, you call that leadership? We have no power. We don't know what to do. You'll never get a job with that kind of thing. You have to go in and say, I'm very powerful, and I know how to do everything. That's the kind of person they're looking for. That's the kind of girl they need. Really? We have no power. We don't know what to do. You know what the very next phrase is? Then the Spirit of God came. You know when the Spirit of God comes to your life and to a church? when in your life and in mine you are prepared to say, I am weak. Not I am inherently sinful, because that's sinful, but I am inherently weak. And when we are prepared to get to that place, then we're able to identify with the wonder of what we're told here, namely that the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, as I've told you before, 
and the bed clothes have formed up like the Matterhorn in front of you, and you're fearful, and you're unhinged, and you're disappointed, and you're sad, and you're empty, and you're lonely, and that's just for starters. And you can only basically say, Father, you can only manage to get out of your mouth, Abba, here's the good news. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. So, that is why God brings into our lives, especially those of us who are smart Alex or smart Alexis, <laughs> those things which will show us our ineffectual dimensions, not so that we can be beaten down, but so that we can discover the wonder of what he delights to do in the lives of those whom he has made his children. We can justifiably recognize that as a father, he watches over us, and he provides for us, and he gives us all things richly to enjoy, including the experiences of pain and illness and marital unsettlement and child-rearing challenges and business eventualities in order that we might make the discovery of Romans 8, 26. It's, it's Andre Crouch, you know, where he says, because if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. So, uh, how's that? It's all coming back to me now. So, I thank him. I thank him for the mountains, and I thank him for the valleys, and I thank him for the things he's brought me through. Because if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. I'd never know what faith in him could do. See, in shunning trials, we miss blessings. In telling everybody how strong we are, we miss the opportunity of discovering how wonderful is the strength that God provides. In suggesting to people that our marriage is entirely intact, and there hasn't been a better marriage since um, 1915, we tell lies, and we fail to make the discovery of God pouring His grace into the fragile nature of our relationships and fulfilling the promise that is here. Well, we could go on generally, and uh, we daren't, because we need to deal with this specifically. And what is he speaking about specifically? Well, he's speaking about prayer. He's speaking about prayer. And I hope this is as much an encouragement to you as it has been to me. Because if there is one area of life that shows how weak we really are, especially in our Christian life, is, is it not prayer? Would anybody stand up and say, uh, you know, I, when it comes to prayer, I've got prayer. I've got it buttoned down. I mean, I, I, I pray all the time. I pray. I pray five times a day. I pray sitting. I pray standing and so on. No, you're not going to do that. If you do, you're just silly. No, you're going to be honest with me, and you're going to say, yes, I find prayer really hard. Well, here's the encouragement. God understands that, and he's made a provision for it. In fact, he's made two provisions for it. In verse 34, we'll come to the fact that he has provided in the Lord Jesus one who intercedes for us in heaven. And here in verse 26 and 27, he tells us that he has provided for us the Holy Spirit who does for us in our hearts what Jesus does for us in heaven. So there you are, verse 26, sentence 2. We do not know. That's where we start. We do not know. <laughs> until, until we know what we don't know, we're in trouble. We do not know how we ought to pray or what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes. 
And when you take this apart, you realize that the Spirit of God prays for us. He prays in us. And he prays through us. It's, it's very hard to get, get your head around this. And it says, Warfield, the desires are ours, and the groans are ours, but not apart from the Spirit. They are his, wrought in us by him. Now, I could read that to myself three times slowly and still find myself saying, you what? And I think what Warfield is saying is that the Spirit of God, when I say what I'm saying, when I think what I'm thinking, when I come before God, when I'm driving in my car or when I'm sitting in my home or in my chair or wherever it is, or I'm kneeling in my study, and, and you say, this is, this is hopeless. I can't, I, I can't, I, I can't pray. The Spirit of God is at work saying, what Beg is trying to say is this. What Beg is, what Beg is on about? He doesn't even know what he's on about himself. But I, I'll tell you what he's on about, Father. That's a great encouragement to me. And I hope it is to you. Because the Spirit of God helps us in our weakness. Not just generally, but specifically in the realm of prayer. He prays through us. Says Calvin, the guarantee of the answer to our prayer is found in the nature of their origin. Where does prayer come from? Prayer actually comes from heaven. God is the originator of prayer. That's the thing. We don't pray. People don't pray except for God. People do everything except pray. Oh, the plane drops 1,000 or 1,500 feet in extreme turbulence over the Alps. They start praying then, crying out in all kinds of ways. But by and large, as soon as it all settles down, we're back to where we were before. No, prayer has its origination in heaven. And that's why God answers prayer. You say, this is even more alarming than I thought before. This is so hard to understand. God thoroughly approves, this is still Calvin, our desires as the thoughts of his own spirit. Our Heavenly Father will not refuse to satisfy yearnings which by his own spirit he has put within you. You see, apart from the Spirit of God, we don't know to pray, your will be done. Apart from the Spirit of God, we don't pray, hallowed be your name. Apart from the Spirit of God, we wouldn't pray, your kingdom come. Now, what if people start doing that and actually meaning it? What's happened to you, says the husband to the wife, that you're saying these prayers and you're writing these things in your journal? What in the world has happened to you? What do you think you're trying to do with all of this? And the husband is alarmed, and justifiably so. And especially when you tell him, the Spirit of God has come to live in me. What? I mean, it was bad enough that you started to go to church, but now you're telling me that God lives in you? That he actually indwells you? Yes. Oh. I don't know what to do with that, he says. Well, we do not know, verse 26, verse 27, but he knows. We do not know, he knows. You've got it all there, don't you? He who searches our hearts is an interesting description of God, isn't it? It's one of the favorite descriptions of God, especially in the Old Testament. You remember when Samuel is going to look for the one who will be anointed king. And God says to Samuel, you look on the outward appearance, but I look on the heart. When Solomon is praying for the dedication of the temple. He says, Oh God, you're the one who searches the hearts of all men. When the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, he says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You know the words of my mouth before I even speak them. This doesn't render prayer irrelevant. This makes prayer effectual. The same God who inspires it and answers it is the God who asks us to do it. He doesn't send us on a fool's errand. Don't fall foul of the notion that because God knows the end from the beginning, prayer is irrelevant. The same God who has ordained the end is the same God who has ordained prayer as a means to bring about the end. And if you have nothing hard to think about, think about that for a little while this afternoon. But God is sovereign over all these things. We don't know. He knows. And I search in vain during the week for a meaningful analogy. I can't come up with an analogy for this. 
even the closest thing that I can come to it is still no good. For example, mother with tiny child. You meet little tiny child. Tiny child is in the bucket. You kneel down to say hello to the aforementioned child, and the child says, hey, and the mother says, oh, she's saying she just loves to see you and be out here in the park. You're like, what? <laughs> How do you know that? Sounds like gibberish to me. Yeah, but you're not her mother. But even then, the mother doesn't inspire that. But there is something there. There's no doubt there is. Or what about the spouse whose husband has had a major significant stroke and is paralyzed all down one side? And when you go to visit as the pastor and to pray, you're confronted by that saddest of scenes that our one's vibrant, strong body is now debilitated as a result of the ravages of the neurological impact of these things. And he says, And his wife says, He says, that he's glad that you've come. And he says he would like you to read the Bible and pray with him. And you say to yourself, there has to be some strange, organic intimacy between that couple for her to be able legitimately to make sense of that inarticulate noise. And when your prayers and mine sound like that, the Spirit of God intercedes in them, through them, for us. And that is our confidence. And let me finish in this way. Think about this in relationship to prayer and preaching. You remember the apostles in Acts 6? They said, we will give ourselves to prayer and to the preaching of the Word. Prayer and preaching. A congregation like this, for good reasons and for ill, may be tempted to think that the real issue is the preaching. For after all, God has pledged to use this strange means to open up the truth of His Word. Fine. God gives gifts to pastors and to teachers, as he's done within the framework of our pastoral team. But actually, prayer is that which renders preaching effective. And when you read, for example, the words of Jesus in John 16, he says that it is the work of the Spirit of God to bring conviction— And it is the work of the Spirit of God to bring illumination. Conviction and illumination. Now, I spoke early on, didn't I, about uh, how God's glory is marred in us, how by nature we're distanced from God, how He has made a great exchange in the gift of Jesus. Some of you are distanced from God. You'd be honest enough to admit that. You've never come to trust in Jesus. You come to church. You're involved in different things. But you have never—you couldn't speak in terms of a divine invasion. You couldn't—you wouldn't speak in those terms. Well, let me ask you, would you you today? Would would you be willing, before you leave today, to admit that you're a sinner and that there is no other possibility of reconciliation with God apart from the work of Jesus on the cross? Have you, as you've listened to me today, had any inclination that actually the truth of this book is really the truth? Then if either of the answers to those questions are positive, let me tell you why that is. Not because of my ability to speak but because of the willingness of God's people to pray. And so I urge you to trust in Christ. And those of you who do trust in Christ, I urge you to pray that others will trust in Christ. For your pastors 
may preach the exact same sermons to vastly different results. Not as a result of a more effective means of articulation, but as a result of intercession. Your intercession. My intercession. But you say, I don't even know how to pray or what to pray. That's okay. The Spirit of God fills in your weaknesses. Here's a closing thought. Maybe Parkside has yet to see what will happen in reaching our communities with the gospel when not only the pastors take up the challenge of proclamation, but when every member of the congregation takes up the challenge of intercession. Because then, you see, it's team. We're all in this together, committed under God to seeing unbelieving people become his committed followers. A compelling reminder of the power of prayer from Alistair Begg and Truth for Life. Today's message is part of our series called Life in the Spirit. In the event that you missed any of the previous messages in this study, you can find them all online at truthforlife.org. But for now, keep listening. Alistair will conclude our time with prayer in just a minute. As Alistair explained today, the Holy Spirit plays an absolutely essential role in both our prayer lives and our understanding of Scripture. And yet, in spite of this, the Spirit is often the least discussed member of the Trinity. The Father and the Son seem more relatable. So, though we believe in the Spirit, we may find ourselves less aware of His presence. Well, to help us gain a better understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit and how he relates to the Father and the Son, we highly recommend a book by Philip Ryken and Michael Lefebvre titled Our Triune God, Living in the Love of the Three-in-One. This helpful resource reveals that the mystery of the Trinity is not simply a doctrine for us to accept. Instead, it is the heart of the gospel. You're welcome to request a copy of this book when you donate to support this ministry today. Your gift enables people access to clear and relevant Bible teaching. When you donate, you're truly ministering to your fellow listeners and strengthening believers all over the world. Give today and be sure to request your copy of the book, Our Triune God. Call 888-588-7884 or give and request the book online at truthforlife.org. And this summer, you're invited to join Alistair on a 14-day Reformation tour of Prague, Germany, and Austria. Immerse yourself in one of the most pivotal periods in all of church history while you enjoy in-person teaching from Alistair. For more information or to register for the trip, visit truthforlife.org slash cruise. Now here's Alistair to conclude today's message. Gracious God, open our blind eyes to who Jesus is and what he's done, and stop our ears, defeat our stubborn wills, and come and help us in our weakness. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit Rest upon and remain with all who believe, now and forevermore. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine, inviting you to join us tomorrow when Alistair reveals how the tragedies of life fit into God's good plan. Be sure to listen Tuesday. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.